Hi, hi. Good to be back. Today we shall be reading Chapter 29. Every army has a traitor. Any news, Ganesh? Asked Bhagirath. Bhagirath and Chandraketu had just joined Ganesh and Karthik on the lead ship. The massive navy was sailing up the Ganga en route to Meluha from the north. Farther ahead, they went to take the Ganga Yamuna road. They had slowed down only for a few hours to allow a boat to rendezvous with them. The boatman carried a message from a Vasudev Pandit. I have just received word that my father's army has conquered Mrittikavati, said Ganesh. Chandraketu was thrilled. That is great news. It is indeed, answered Ganesh. And it gets even better. The citizens of Mrittikavati have been won over to my father's side. They have imprisoned what was left of the Meluhan army in the city. And have they discovered the location of the Somaras factory? asked Bhagirath. Yes, said Karthik. It's Devagiri. Devagiri? What are you saying? That is so stupid. It's their capital. One would think that the factory would be built in a secure secret location. But they could have built this factory only within cities with large populations, right? And if so, which city could be better than Devagiri? They must have assumed that they could certainly keep their capital safe. So what are our orders now? asked Chandraketu. The Maluhans have only 75,000 soldiers in Devagiri, said Ganesh. So we are going to launch a coordinated attack. What are the details of the plan? We are to sail up the Ganga and reach the Ganga Yamuna road. We will then march to Meluha. My father is going to sail up the Yamuna in a fleet to meet us as we march. Together we will then sail down to Devagiri. My mother in the meantime will arrive with the hundred thousand soldiers under her command. So we will have two hundred and fifty thousand soldiers, all fired up with the fervor of recent victories against seventy-five thousand Meluhans holed up on their platforms, said Bhagirath. I like the odds. That's exactly what Baba must have said, grinned Karthik. You are going to give me the answer I want, growled Vidun Mali, whether you like it or not. A Vasudev major captured from Shiva's army had been tied up on a movable wooden rack with thick leather ropes. The stale air in the dark dungeon was putrid. The captured Vasudev was already drenched in his own sweat, but unafraid. The Meluhan soldiers, standing at a distance, looked at Vidun Mali warily. What their brigadier was asking them to do was against the laws of Lord Ram. But they were too well trained. Maluhan military training demanded unquestioning obedience to one's commanding officer. This training had forced the soldiers to suppress their misgivings and carry out Vidun Mali's order until now. But their moral code was about to be challenged even more strongly. Vidun Mali heard the Vasudev whispering something again and again. He bent close. Do you have something to say? The Vasudev soldier kept mumbling softly, drawing strength from his words. Jai Guru Vishwamitra, Jai Guru Vashisht, Jai Guru Vishwamitra, Jai Guru Vashisht. Vidun Mali sniggered. They aren't here to help you, my friend. He turned and beckoned a startled Meluhan soldier. The brigadier pointed at a metallic hammer and large nail. My lord, whispered the nervous soldier, knowing full well that to attack an unarmed and bound man was against Lord Ram's principles. I'm not sure if we should... It's not your job to be sure, growled Vidun Mali. That's my job. Your job is to do what I order you to do. Yes, my lord, said the Meluhan, saluting slowly. He picked up the hammer and nail. He walked slowly to the Vasudev and placed the nail on the captive's arm, a few inch above the wrist. He held the hammer back and flexed his shoulders, ready to strike. 
Vidun Mali turned to the Vasudev. You would better start talking. Jai Guru Vishwamitra, Jai Guru Vishisht. Vidun Mali nodded to the soldier. Jai Guru Vishwamitra, Jai Guru, and there was a scream. <coughs> the ear splitting scream from the Vasudev resounded loudly in the confines of the dungeons. But these deep, abundant underground hellhole, somewhere between Mrittik Avati and Devagiri, had not been used in centuries. There was nobody around to hear his screams, except for the nervous Meluhan soldier at the back of the room, who kept praying to Lord Ram, begging for his forgiveness. The soldier kept robotically hammering away, pushing the nail deep into the Vasudev's right arm. The Vasudev kept screaming up to a point where his brain simply blocked the pain. He couldn't feel his arm anymore. His heart was pumping madly as blood came out in spurts through the gaping injury. Vidun Mali approached his ears as the Vasudev breathed heavily, trying to focus on his tribe, on his gods, on his vows, on anything except his right arm. Do you need some more persuasion? asked Vidun Mali. The Vasudev looked away, focusing his mind on his chant. Vidun Mali yanked the nail out, took a wet cloth and wiped the Vasudev's arm. Then he picked up a small bottle and poured its contents into the wound. It burned deeply, but the Vasudev's blood clotted almost immediately. I don't want you to die, whispered Vidun Mali. At least, not yet. Vidun Mali turned towards his soldier and nodded. My lord, whispered the soldier. With tears in his eyes, he had lost count of the number of sins that he was taking upon his soul. Please. Vidun Mali glared. The soldier immediately turned and picked up another bottle. He walked up to the Vasudev and poured some of the vicious liquid into the wound he had inflicted. Vidun Mali stepped back and returned with a long flint, its edges burning slowly. I hope you see the light after this. The Vasudev's eyes opened wide in terror, but he refused to talk. He knew he couldn't reveal the secret. It would be devastating for his tribe. Jai Guru Vishwa, fire will purify you, whispered Vidur Mali softly, and you will speak. Mitra, Jai Guru Vash. The dungeon resonated once again with the desperate screams of the Vasudev as the smell of burning flesh defiled the room. Are you sure? asked Parvateshwar. As sure as I can ever be, said a smiling Vidun Mali. Parvateshwar took a deep breath. He knew that it was Shiva who led the massive fleet of ships that had just sped past Devagiri two weeks back. Parvateshwar suspected that Shiva was sailing north to pick up Ganesha's army and bring them back to Devagiri. He had also received reports about the delays faced by Ganesha's army as they marched through the washed-out Ganga Yamuna road. It would probably take a month for Shiva to return to Devagiri, along with the 150,000 soldiers in Ganesha's army. He also knew that another contingent of the Nilkant's army, being led by Sati, had just sailed out of Mrittikavati. They would reach Devagiri in a week or two. Knowing full well that Ganesh would be delayed, Parvateshwar expected Sati's army to reach Devagiri first. He also knew that this was a force of 100,000 soldiers against his own 75,000. Once Shiva and Ganesha's army sailed in, the strength of the enemy would rise to 250,000. Parvateshwar knew that his best chance was to attack Sati's army before Shiva and Ganesh arrived. The only problem was that he had no answer for the unstoppable Vasudev elephant corps under Sati's command, until now. Chili and dung? asked Parvateshwar. It just seems so simple. Apparently, the elephants don't like the smell of chili, my lord. It makes them run amok. We should keep dung bricks mixed with chili ready, burn them and catapult them towards the elephants. The acrid smoke will drive them crazy and hopefully into their own army. There are no elephants to test this on, Vidun Mali. The only way to test this would be in battle. What if this doesn't work? 
My apologies, General, but do we have any other opinions? No. Then what's the harm in trying? Parvateshwar nodded and turned to stare at his soldiers practicing in the distance. How did you get this information? Vidun Mali was quiet. Parvateshwar returned his gaze to Vidun Mali, his eyes boring into him. Brigadier, I asked you a question. There are traitors in every army, my lord. Parvateshwar was stunned. The famous Vasudev discipline was legendary. You found a Vasudev traitor? Like I said, there are traitors in every army. How do you think I escaped? Parvateshwar turned and looked once again at his soldier. No harm in trying this tactic. It just might work. Devagiri, the abode of the gods, had become the city of the thoroughly bewildered. Its 200,000 citizens could not recall a time in living memory when an army had gathered the gumption to march up to their city. And yet, here they were, witness to unbelievable occurrences. Just a few weeks earlier, they had seen a large fleet of warships race past their city, rowing furiously up the Saraswati. It was clear that these ships were a part of the Mrittikavati based Meluhan fleet and that it was now in control of the enemy. Why those enemy ships simply sailed by without attacking Devagiri was a mystery. News had also filtered in about a massive army garrisoning itself next to the Saraswati, about 10 kilometers south of the city. The normally secure Devagiri citizens now confined themselves within the walls of the city not venturing out unless absolutely necessary. Merchants had also halted all their trading activities and their merchant ships remained anchored at the port. Rumours ran rife in the city. Some whispered that the enemy army stationed south of Devagiri was led by the Nilkant himself. Others swore they saw the Nilkant on the warships that had sailed past. However, they couldn't hazard a guess as to where Lord Nilkant was headed in such a hurry. Facts had also found their way in from other cities that except for Mrittikavati, this mammoth army had not engaged in battle with any other Meluhan city while sailing up the Saraswati. They had not looted any city or plundered any village, nor had they committed any acts of wanton destruction, but had marched through Meluha with almost hermit-like restraint. Some were beginning to believe that perhaps the purported gossip they had heard was in fact true. The Nilkant was not against Meluha, but only the Somras. Thus the proclamation they had read many months ago was actually from their lord and not a lie, as their emperor had stated. That may be the Nilkant's army waited at the banks of the Saraswati without attacking, because the lord himself was negotiating possible terms of surrender with the emperor. But there were also others, still loyal to Meluha, who refused to believe that their government could have lied. They had good reason to believe that the armies of Shiva comprised the Chandravanshis and the Nagas, that the Naga queen was a senior commander in the Nilkant's army, and the Nilkant had been misled by the evil combination of the Chandravanshis and the Nagas. They were willing to lay down their lives for Meluha. What they didn't understand was why their army was not engaging in battle as yet. Are you sure, General? asked Vrigu. Parvateshwar was in Vrigu's chamber in the Devagiri royal palace. Yes, it is a gamble, but we have to take it. If we wait too long, the Lord will lead Ganesha's army from the Yamuna to Devagiri. Combined with Sati's army, they will then have a vast numerical advantage and it will be impossible for us to win. Right now, our opponents are only Sati's soldiers who have garrisoned themselves close to the river. They are obviously not looking for a fight. I plan to draw them out and then try to cause some chaos amongst their elephant. If it works, their elephants may just charge back into their own army. They would have no room to retreat, with the river right behind them. If everything goes according to plan, we may just win the day. 
isn't Sati your goddaughter? asked Rigu, looking deeply into Parvateshwar's eyes. Parvateshwar held his breath. At this point of time, she is only an enemy of Meluha to me. Vrigu continued to peer into his eyes, increasingly satisfied with what he read. If you are convinced, General, then so am I. In the name of Lord Ram, attack. Sati couldn't remain holed up on her anchored ships. Ships are unassailable from land when sailing fast. But sitting ducks when they are anchored, susceptible to bombardment and devil boat assaults. So she had decided to garrison herself on land, which would offer protection to her ships as well, by deterring the Maluhans from coming too close to the river banks. Sati had chosen a good location to dig in her army. It was a large, gently rolling hill, right next to the Saraswati. The trees between the hill and the city of Devagiri had been cut down. Therefore, from the vantage point of the hill, Sati had a clear line of sight of enemy movements at the Devagiri city gates, 10 kilometers away. The height of the hill also gave her another advantage. Charging downhill was far easier than advancing uphill, which her enemies would have to do. The elevation also increased the range of her archers significantly. Having occupied the high ground, Sati then opted to assume the most effective of defensive military formations, the Chakra view. The core of the Chakra view comprised columns of infantrymen in the tortoise position. The tortoises themselves were protected to the rear by the river and the Saraswati fleet at anchor in the middle of the river. They would provide protection against any Meluhan forces that might attack from the river end. Rowboats had been beached and tied in the river shallows as a contingency for retreating if necessary. Rows of cavalry three layers deep reinforced the core towards the front. Two rows of warship formed an impregnable semicircular outer shell, protecting the formations within. The giant chakra view comprising 50,000 soldiers left adequate space between the lines for inner maneuverability and for fortification of the outer shell by the cavalry in case of a breach. All the animals had been outfitted with thin metallic armor and the soldiers had broad bronze shields to protect against any long-range arrows. It was a near-perfect defensive formation, designed to avoid battle and allow a quick retreat if needed. Sati intended to remain in his formation till she heard from Shiva.